Welcome to Tabletop Tactics and welcome to Warhammer The Old World, where man is beset on all sides by savage orcs, the foul forces of the undead and the insidious forces of chaos. Today we'll be taking you through how to play, covering the principles of the game as well as the core rule to help you get started with your battles within the old world. The rule set for the old world is wonderfully in depth but also large and complex. So during this video we may refer you to specific pages in the rule book for further reading where appropriate. First of all, we'll take you through an overview starting with mustering your forces. To play a game of Warhammer the Old World, each player will need an army to command, so the first thing to do is assemble your forces. You can simply use all the models in your collection, but most players use points values and army lists to ensure that forces are evenly matched for a closely fought battle. This system is explained in the Warhammer Army section on page 276. Next we choose our scenario. The Warhammer Battle section on page 287 presents six pitched battles. Each of these explains how to play a slightly different type of battle, ranging from a straightforward clash of forces to a fight in a mountain pass or the defense of a watchtower. Next, you will need a battlefield, which can be set up on any flat surface, be it the kitchen table, the floor, or a dedicated war games table. The players set up terrain for their armies to fight over, representing woods, fortified watchtowers, and other features that make up the landscapes of the Warhammer world. How to do this is covered in the Warhammer Battle section on page 285. The rival armies are then deployed, facing each other across the battlefield, ready to fight. Details of how to deploy can be found in the Warhammer Battle section. Each of the pitch battle scenarios include a map showing where on the battlefield each player can place their models and tells which side will take the first turn of the game. And now to battle. The players fight out the battle, each taking turns in which their army will move, shoot, wield mighty magic and fight vicious combat. All of this is done using the rules that follow. These rules start with basic rules that apply to all models and cover the standard sequence of moving, shooting, fighting and more. Each pitch battle also explains how many rounds to play before the game ends. In the aftermath of the battle, the players must work out which side stands victorious. Each pitch battle explains how to work out who has won the game, but in most cases, the victor is the side that has destroyed more of the enemy and so it's often obvious who has won. Whatever the outcome, only a rematch will give you the chance for further glory or sweet revenge. With the flow of the game covered, let's continue on to the principles of the game. In games of Warhammer The Old World, all distances are measured in inches using a ruler or tape measure, and can be measured at any time. Distances between models and all other objects, which can be other models, terrain features and so on, are always measured from the closest point on one base to the closest point on the other base. Sometimes units will be mounted on movement trays for ease, such as large infantry units like these Imperial State Troopers. Whether they have a movement tray or not, always use a model's base as the reference point when taking your measurements. Warhammer The Old World uses dice of different types to determine the outcome of various actions and events as you play your game. These include D6, D3, and Artillery and Scatter Dice. Next we'll cover templates. These are used to represent the effect of certain weapons such as catapults and various types of artillery. Firstly, Blast Templates. A Blast Template is a round template 3 or 5 inches in diameter. And then we have Flame Templates. A Flame Template is a teardrop shaped template approximately 8 inches in length. These are both used to determine which models are hit by an attack that has an area of effect or blast radius. If an attack uses a template, the core rulebook will explain how to position it and how it might scatter. The miniatures used to play games of Warhammer The Old World are referred to as models in the rules that follow. Models represent a huge variety of troops, each with its own skills and capabilities. To reflect this, each model has its own characteristics profile. Each model has a profile of nine characteristics. Movement, weapon skill, ballistic skill, strength, toughness, wounds, initiative, attacks, and leadership. These are used to describe the various attributes of different models. All characteristics are rated on a scale from zero to 10. They cannot go below zero, and only in the rarest of cases will they rise above 10. Some models have two or more rows on their characteristics profile, often with gaps in each, shown as a dash. Each row represents a different model, combined together into a single profile. 
This demigriff knight, for example, has one row to represent the rider and one for their mount. Split profiles are explained in greater detail in the advanced rules found on various pages of the core rules highlighted in the index. At various times, a model or unit might be called upon to make a leadership test. To make a leadership test, roll 2d6. If the result is equal or less than the model's leadership value, then the test has been passed. If the result is greater than the model's leadership value, the test has been failed. This will often result in the unit fleeing as described on page 132. In addition to its profile, a model's rules include other information vital to the game. What these are will vary from model to model. Almost every model will have a points value given within its profile. Points values reflect a model's worth within its army. Most models have a basic points value that increases as various optional items of equipment, weapons, armor, magic items for example, are added. By adding together the points values of all of the models you have selected, you find the total points value of your army. Knowing this enables players to play an evenly matched battle. Points values and the rules for building an army are explained in greater detail in the Warhammer Army section on page 276 of the core rulebook. All models have a troop type given as part of their rules. And there are five broad categories for each troop type. Infantry, cavalry, chariots, monsters, and war machines. Troop types and their rules are explained in brief on page 104 and in greater detail in the advanced rules. Characters are explained in greater detail in the characters section on page 202 of the core rulebook. Other elements include guides for base sizes for each unit, the equipment they carry to battle, including weapons and armor, the amount of models that make up a unit, and their armor value, which determines their armor save characteristic. The rules for many of the weapons and armor carried and worn by models can be found in the Weapons of War section on page 212 and 220. Next, we'll cover wizards. Magic is in abundance in the old world and wizards are able to bend the winds of magic to their will. Whilst not all models are able to wield such powers, those that can have this information within their rules. This details the types of magics and spells they can use, as well as their level of wizardry. We'll go into more detail on magic later. In addition to the special rules associated with their troop type, many models have one or more special rules. These fall into three broad categories. Universal special rules are rules that appear in all armies, and a full list of these can be found on page 166 of the core rulebook. Army special rules, this highlights rules unique to the army the model belongs to. And finally, we have unique special rules. Some models have special rules unique to them. If a model has one or more unique special rules, these will be listed as part of its rules. Now we'll cover forming units. The models that make up your army must be formed into units before battle commences, ideally when writing your army list as described on page 276 of the core rulebook. A unit usually consists of several models of the same type that have banded together and adopted a specific formation. Additionally, single, powerful models such as a character, a chariot or dragon, a war machine and its crew and so on are also considered to be a unit. Therefore, whenever the rules that follow refer to units, this also includes units made up of one model. All units must adopt a formation. The type of formation a unit adopts will influence how it acts in battle, how it moves, how it fights and so on. Each type of formation has its own rules. The types of formation a unit can adopt are indicated by a special rule of the same name. Models with more than one such special rule may choose their formation during deployment and may change it and adopt a different formation by reforming during the game as detailed on page 125 of the rulebook. Close order formations are by far the most usual. Therefore, the core how to play rules focus upon such units. Examples of more unusual types of formation are covered in the advanced rules section on page 182. Additionally, some army lists introduce special formation types unique to them, such as the Bretonian Lance Formation. A unit arrayed in serried ranks is said to be in a close order formation. A unit in close order consists of two or more models that are arranged in base contact with each other, edge to edge and front corner to front corner as shown here. All models in such a unit must face in the same direction. In addition, the models must be arranged into a formation that consists of one or more horizontal rows called ranks, and a number of vertical rows called files. As far as possible, there must be the same number of models in each rank. 
Once formed into a unit, the models move and fight as a single entity for the entire battle. Most models have a front, flank and rear arc based on the direction they are facing. These arcs are to determine what the model can see and to determine the direction of an enemy charge. Most models have a front, flank and rear arc based on the direction they are facing. These arcs are to determine what the model can see and to determine the direction of an enemy charge. A model's front, flank and rear arc extend out from the corners of its base at 45 degree angles, forming four 90 degree quadrants as shown here. Models can only draw a line of sight to things that lie within their vision arc. Unless stated otherwise, models have a 90 degree vision arc, corresponding to their front arc. You will often need to determine if one model or unit has line of sight to another. To check the line of sight between models, stoop down to look from the model's point of view. If a straight, uninterrupted line can be drawn from within the model's vision arc to any part of the other model, there is a line of sight. If no such line can be drawn to the other model due to intervening terrain or without crossing over or through other friendly or enemy model, there is no line of sight. Note that models and units always block line of sight. Therefore, it is normally only the models in the front rank that have line of sight. Line of sight may be partly obscured by terrain features or by other models. The benefits of partial and full cover are discussed in more detail under the rules for shooting on page 139 of the core rulebook. As mentioned previously, all models have a troop type. These, along with the type of formation units of such models adopt, determine how they function throughout the rules, as well as providing an insight into the role such models fulfill on the battlefield. Troop types and their rules are explained in greater detail in the advanced rules on page 188. The final section of the principles of the old world is magic. The Warhammer world is an intrinsically magical place. In battle, magic is a force as real and potent as a sword blade. Its use is limited only by the imagination and skill of the wizard that wields it. Wizards are able to cast spells of different types throughout the turn and players must protect them accordingly, ensuring they are able to cast the right spell at the right moment. That being the case, explaining how magic works early when learning to play is an important, albeit in-depth part of the old world, so we would encourage players to read the rules for this section in their own time. Rules for wizards, levels of wizardry, the laws of magic, spell categories, casting and dispelling magic can all be found through pages 106 to 111 of the rulebook. With the principles now complete, it's time to move on to the core rules and we'll begin by covering the strategy phase. During the strategy phase, the active player begins to enact their plans for the turn ahead. Key to this is wizards channeling and manipulating the winds of magic, and commanders rallying their forces through strict orders or inspiring words. The start of the turn. Some units will have special actions they have to perform or tests they have to make at the start of the turn. Such rules are not common, and their details will be clearly stated in the model's rules. Such actions are performed and tests made during this subphase are chosen by the active player. This subphase should also be used as a moment to think between turns during which you can remove stray casualties, errant dice, and other bits of gaming detritus that have accumulated. Often players will have questions to ask their opponent, such as how a special rule works, or what a magic item does. This is a perfect time to ask such questions, and an opponent should never begrudge giving answers during this natural pause in the action. In the command subphase, the active player chooses one of their models, usually a character, that is not fleeing and that has one or more special rules that can be used during the command subphase. In this example, the High Priestess is able to perform her Arise ability, allowing her the chance to bring her warriors back from the dead. The details of how she performs this action can be found in her rules in the Ravening Horde's book on page 128. Next, the active player can attempt Conjuration. Many wizards are able to cast enhancement spells to the benefit of friendly units. Other wizards are able to cast hex spells, hindering the enemy in some way. Next is rallying fleeing units. During this subphase, the active player must attempt to rally any of their units that are fleeing by making a rally test for each such unit. To make a rally test, choose a fleeing unit and test against its leadership characteristic by rolling 2d6. If the result is equal to or less than the unit's leadership characteristic, it has passed and the unit has successfully rallied. If this test is failed, the unit has been unable to rally and it continues fleeing a further 2d6 inches. Then, the active player chooses another fleeing unit, repeating the process until all fleeing units have had a chance to rally. 
To summarize the strategy phase, first comes the start of the turn. The rules will often call upon a player to make certain tests or perform specific actions at the start of a turn. Then the commands. Some characters have special rules that may represent bold heroes seeking to inspire their comrades or fabulous abilities granted by magic items. These special rules are used now. Then conjuration. Many wizards use their magic to aid their allies in battle, otherwise use it to inflict terrible curses upon their enemies. Known respectively as enhancement and hex spells, these are cast now. And then finally, we rally our fleeing troops. As warriors fall, many units turn and flee. During the subphase, you have a chance to rally any fleeing units. Those that are successful will return to the fray, those that are not will continue to flee. We now move on to the movement phase. Mastery of the movement phase is vital to victory on the battlefield. It is in this phase that you will attempt to outmaneuver your foe by moving archers into positions from which to dominate the battlefield, advancing cavalry along a flank to exploit enemy weaknesses, and positioning regiments to intimidate the enemy before charging boldly into combat when the time is right. As movement is such a vital part of the game, this section is broken down into two parts. The first gives an overview of the movement phase itself. The second explains movement in greater detail. As with other phases of the game, the movement phase is broken down into four sub-phases. These are worked through in order of declaring charges and charge reactions, charge moves, compulsory moves and remaining moves. The units in your army can act in whatever order you wish within each sub-phase, providing that you complete one sub-phase before moving on to the next. Before we cover the two parts of the movement phase, there is one rule of movement to cover that applies throughout the game. The one inch rule. Quite simply, with the exception of units engaged in combat, no unit can end its movement within one inch of an enemy unit. Often a unit will have to move within one inch of another unit during its move. This is perfectly acceptable, provided that at the end of the movement, there is one inch between it and any enemy units. At the start of your movement phase, the first thing you must do is declare which units, if any, will charge. Units are not normally obliged to charge unless a special rule states otherwise. Charging is the only way for a unit to move itself into combat with the foe. If you want to engage an enemy in combat, then you must charge them. You cannot simply move into combat without having first declared a charge. When you declare a charge, one or more of the models in your unit must be able to draw a line of sight to the charge target, and the charge target must lie at least partially within the charging unit's front arc. You are always allowed to measure the distance between your unit and the potential charge target before declaring the charge and should take into account any terrain that might slow the unit down as this may well affect your decision whether or not to declare a charge in the first place. Charge movement is explained in greater detail on page 126 of the rulebook. Not all units can charge. Units that are already engaged in combat, that are fleeing, or that rally during the strategy phase of this turn cannot declare a charge or make a charge move. Units that are in a marching column can declare a charge, but cannot make a charge move. In rarer cases, units may be prevented from either declaring a charge or making a charge move by a special rule or spell effect. Additionally, a unit cannot declare an impossible charge, i.e. one that it cannot possibly complete either because the enemy unit lies beyond the charger's maximum possible charge range or because an intervening obstructions make it impossible for the unit to make a charge move that allows it to move into contact. Once the active player has declared all of their charges, the inactive player declares a charge reaction for each of the charge targets. There are three charge reactions available to the inactive player. Hold, stand and shoot, and flee. Hold. The unit opts to stand its ground and receive the charge. This is the usual response for units that do not have missile weapons or those units that favor their chances in the fight ahead. Fleeing units cannot hold. Units already engaged in combat when charged must hold. Stand and shoot. If a unit is armed with missile weapons and can draw a line of sight to the charging unit, it may declare that it will attempt to stand and shoot. Measure the distance between the two units. If the distance is less than the movement characteristic of the charging unit, the charged unit is unable to raise its weapons in time and must either hold or flee instead. Otherwise, even if the distance between the two units is greater than the maximum range of the charged unit's weapons, the charged unit will shoot at the charging unit. Once this shooting has been resolved, the charged unit will hold and await the charging unit. 
Charging units are not required to make panic tests, so don't worry if you take too many casualties on the way in. Fleeing units and units already engaged in combat when charged cannot stand and shoot. Flee. Any unit that is not already engaged in combat may flee as a charge reaction. When a unit chooses to flee from a charge, it flees directly away from the charging unit. Pivot the unit about its center so that it's facing directly away from the center of the charging enemy unit. After pivoting, the unit makes an immediate flee move of 2d6 inches. Should a fleeing unit not run far enough, it may be run down and destroyed by the charging unit. Next, we have charge moves. With charge reactions declared and resolved, it's time to see whether or not the charges are successful. How far a unit can charge is based on its movement characteristic. However, because a charge represents warriors rushing forward at speed, units can charge farther than their basic movement characteristic. To represent this, a unit's charge range is determined by first making a charge roll. To make a charge roll, roll 2d6 and discard the lowest result. The highest result is the result of the charge roll. The result of the charge roll is then added to the unit's move characteristic to give the unit's charge range. With its charge range established, the charging unit makes its charge move. Moving a charging unit is often a complicated procedure. For this reason, the charge move itself is covered in greater detail on page 126 of the rulebook after the basics of movement and maneuver have been explained. Generally speaking, a player can move their units however they wish within the confines of the rules. However, sometimes units behave of their own accord. Fleeing units. Units that fail to rally during the strategy phase will continue to flee during the compulsory move subphase. Fleeing units must be moved at the beginning of this subphase before moving any other units that are obliged to make a compulsory move. Moving a fleeing unit is often a complicated procedure. For this reason, fleeing itself is covered in greater detail on page 132 of the core rules after the basics of movement and manoeuvre have been explained in more detail. The final movement subphase is remaining moves. With all charges and compulsory moves attended to, you are now free to move the rest of your army. During this subphase, there are six manoeuvres a unit can perform outside of moving in a straight line. The first and most common is the wheel. When a unit wheels, the leading edge of the unit moves forward, pivoting around one of its corners. Every model counts as having moved as far as the outside model. Next, the turn. To execute a turn, all models remain in place, but are turned 90 or 180 degrees to face their side or rear. For every 90 degrees the unit moves, it uses a quarter of its movement characteristic. Moving backwards or sideways is possible, but when doing so, the unit must halve their movement characteristic. Redressing the ranks. Units can adjust their ranks by adjusting models to or from their rear ranks to increase or decrease the number of models in their front rank. A unit may deduct up to half its movement characteristic to add or remove up to five models from its front rank. Models in the remaining ranks are then rearranged to match the number of models in the front rank. And finally, reform. Reforming allows units to sacrifice its entire movement to pivot about its center up to 180 degrees, as well as rearranging its ranks. Next, it's time for us to cover the shooting phase. During this phase, your army lets fly with the missile weapons at its disposal be they humble bows, fantastical war machines, or devastating spells. This section covers the shooting rules for common weapons and the majority of troop types and war machines. However, even the most colossal trebuchet and the most powerful wizard is governed by many of the same rules as the humble bow and arrow, so it's worth reading through this section before unlimbering your organ gun. Wizards can unleash spells in the shooting phase as well, albeit with magic. We recommend reading this section separately on page 107 of the rulebook, as the same principles don't apply to wizards. Just like the other phases of the game, the shooting phase is broken down into four sub-phases. However, unlike the strategy and movement phases, the shooting phase sequence is followed in full for each unit one at a time. Simply choose a unit in your army, then complete all four sub-phases for that unit in order. Choosing units and declaring targets. The active player chooses one unit in their army that is able to shoot and completes the shooting phase sequence for that unit. This process is repeated until all units have had a chance to shoot. Who can shoot? Not all units are able to shoot. Only units equipped with missile weapons, including war machines, or that can cast certain types of spell, such as magic missiles, can shoot. A unit cannot shoot if it charged or marched during the preceding movement phase. It is engaged in combat or it is fleeing. Check line of sight. 
In order to shoot at something, a model must be able to draw a line of sight to it, as described previously. Often, not every model in a unit will be able to draw a line of sight to the target. Therefore, when shooting with a unit, you must determine line of sight for each and every model in the front rank. Check range. All missile weapons have a maximum range. A model cannot shoot at a target if it lies beyond the maximum range. Often, not every model in a unit will be within range of the target. Therefore, you must check the range of each model in a unit individually. Declare target. With line of sight and range checked, the active player must declare which enemy unit will be the target of the shooting unit. How many shots? A unit can shoot only once per shooting phase and most models can only make one shooting attack. The number of attacks a model has does not affect the number of shots it can make. Next, we will cover rolling to hit. To determine whether a model hits its target, you must make a hit roll. You can do this by rolling a d6 for each model that is shooting and look up the target number needed on the following table. To speed the process up, rather than rolling one dice at a time for each model, count how many models in your unit are shooting and roll a batch of that many dice. Regardless of a warrior's skill, shots can always go awry. When making a roll to hit, a roll of a natural run is always a fail regardless of modifiers. Many battlefield conditions can reduce the accuracy of shooting. These are represented by a series of modifiers that are applied to rolls to hit. The most commonly encountered to hit modifiers are as follows, though others may also apply. Moving and shooting gives a minus one to hit. Firing at long range and standing and shooting also gives a minus one to hit. If a target is behind partial cover, that gives a minus one to hit. If a target is behind full cover, that gives a minus two modifier to hit. Some models like this Screaming Skull Catapult don't use ballistic skill and instead shoot with template weapons. When the active player selects an enemy unit that's within range, they then determine which models risk being hit by a template. Hold it in place and look to see which model's bases lie underneath it. A model whose base lies completely underneath the template or partially underneath the central hole of a blast template is hit automatically. A model whose base lies partially underneath the template is hit on a d6 roll of a 4 plus. To determine whether a shot scatters, place a template on the battlefield, then roll a scatter die to determine a direction and a d6 to determine a distance. If a hit is rolled on the scatter dice, the object does not move. Leave it in place and resolve the rest of the rule. If an arrow is rolled, move the object the distance in inches indicated by the roll of the d6 in the direction indicated. Rolling to wound and making armor saves. To determine how many hits cause wounds, you must make a roll to wound for each hit. To make a roll to wound, pick up each dice that caused the hit and roll it again. Then consult the to wounds chart, cross-referencing the weapon's strength characteristic, given its profile, with the target's toughness. Any dice that equal or beat the target number shown, after applying any modifiers, have caused a wound. Profiles for the most common missile weapons can be found on page 216 of the rulebook. More unusual, army-specific weapons can be found in the relevant army list. Too tough to wound. If your strength is six or more points lower than your target's toughness characteristic, you cannot wound them. They are simply too tough. Make armor saves. Few warriors enter battle without the protection of armor. To represent this, your opponent can make an armor save roll for each wound caused by your shooting. To make an armor save roll, roll a d6 for the wounded model and compare the result to that model's armor value. If the armor save roll equals or exceeds the model's armor value, the model is saved by its armor and the wound discarded. If the result is less than the model's armor value, the model's armor has proved ineffective and the wound is unsaved. Even the heaviest and most finely crafted of armor has gaps in it. When making an armor save roll of any type, a roll of a natural one is always a fail, regardless of modifiers. A ward save represents the magical protection offered by an enchanted talisman or a suit of armor. The armor value of a ward save will always be shown either in the description of the item that grants it or as a special rule. The key difference between a ward save and a regular armor save is that a ward save can never be modified by the AP characteristic of a weapon. Removing casualties and making panic tests. Unsaved wounds are applied to the target unit, causing models to be removed as casualties. If a unit loses enough models, it will have to make a panic test and may fall back or flee. 
If during a single shooting phase, a unit loses more than 25% of the models it contained at the start of that shooting phase, it must immediately make a panic test. To make a panic test, test against the unit's leadership characteristic by rolling 2d6. If you roll above the unit's leadership characteristic, this test is failed and the unit has succumbed to panic. If this test is passed, the unit remains resolute and does not panic. Fall back or flee. What happens to a unit that fails a panic test will depend upon how many casualties it has suffered. A unit that has suffered only a few casualties will fall back in good order, whereas a unit that has suffered a significant amount of casualties will turn tail and flee. If a unit contains more than half or 50% of the models it contained at the start of the battle, it will fall back in good order. The unit moves directly away from the enemy unit whose shooting caused it to make the panic test, as described on page 134. Flee. If a unit contains only half or 50%, or fewer than half of the models it contained at the start of the battle, it will immediately turn tail and flee. The unit flees directly away from the enemy unit whose shooting caused it to make the panic test, as described on page 134. To summarise the shooting phase, first we choose units and declare targets. The active player chooses a unit in their army that's able to shoot, then they check the unit's range and line of sight to any potential targets before declaring its target. Then we roll to hit. The active player rolls to hit for the shooting unit. Sometimes not all models will be able to shoot, and of those that can, certain modifiers may need to be applied for their roll to hit. Then we roll to wound and make armour saves. For each roll that causes a wound, their opponent may be able to make an armour save roll. And then finally, we remove casualties and make panic tests. For each unsaved wound caused, the target unit loses one wound. Models reduced to zero wounds are removed as casualties. If enough casualties are caused, the unit will have to make a panic test. The combat phase can completely change the fortunes of your army and, if you have prepared well in your earlier phases, victory is likely to be your reward. The combat phase heavily involves both players, although the active player will be the one choosing the order in which each of the combats is fought and resolved. All combats must be resolved during this phase. A unit engaged in combat with the enemy cannot choose not to fight. The combat phase sequence. As usual, the combat phase is broken down into four sub-phases. This sequence is followed in full for each combat, one at a time. The active player simply chooses their combat and both players complete all four sub-phases in the order that we're about to show you. End of turn. Once all combats have been resolved, the active player's turn ends. Play then passes to the inactive player and their turn begins. As each turn ends and a new one begins, it is worth making a note of how many turns and rounds have been played. Let's begin with Choose Combat and Fight. The Choose Combat and Fight subphase is further broken down into four steps. These are Choose Combat and Determine Who Can Fight, Roll to Hit, Roll to Wound and Make Armor Saves, and Remove Casualties. Any units that are in base contact with one or more enemy units are engaged in combat. Each individual engagement between two or more units is referred to as a combat. The active player chooses one combat to be resolved in full, referred to as fighting a round of combat. Who can fight? It is rare that every model in a unit is able to fight. Usually, only models in a fighting rank can fight, whilst the models behind them press forward, ready to take the place of the fallen. Base contact. Any model that is in base contact with an enemy model can fight, even if the enemy model is in contact with its flank or rear, and even if the model's bases only touch at the corner. The fighting rank. When two opposing units are engaged in combat, any row of models, be it rank or file, that has one or more models in base contact with the enemy is called the fighting rank. Every model within the fighting rank can fight. This represents models in that row, but not in base contact with the enemy encircling the foe. Supporting attacks. Some models are equipped with weapons that allow them to make supporting attacks. To make a supporting attack, a model must be directly behind a friendly model that is itself in a fighting rank. However, Supporting attacks cannot be made to a unit's flank or rear, nor can they be made by a model that is itself fighting in a rank. How many attacks? When a model fights in combat, it makes a number of attacks. How many is determined by its attacks characteristic and its proximity to the enemy. If a model is in base contact with an enemy model, it makes a number of attacks equal to its attacks characteristic. If a model is able to fight, but is not in base contact with an enemy model, it can make only one attack, regardless of its attack's characteristic. Who strikes first? 
A model's initiative characteristic determines when it attacks. Work your way through the initiative values of the models, starting with the highest and ending with the lowest. Models make attacks when their initiative value is reached. Charging units. Charging into the enemy gives a considerable advantage, which is increased when charging into an enemy's vulnerable flank or rear. To represent this, every model within a charging unit modifies its initiative characteristic for the remainder of that turn. Charging an enemy in their front arc, plus one initiative per full inch moved, prior to making contact, to a maximum of plus three. Charging an enemy in their flank or rear arc, plus one initiative per full inch moved, prior to making contact, to a maximum of plus four. Simultaneous combat. If models on both sides for combat have the same initiative value after modifiers, they will attack at the same time. To simplify this, the active player should resolve their attacks first, followed by their opponent. Casualties caused by the active player during simultaneous combat do not reduce the number of attacks made by enemy models with the same initiative value. We can't all fight. Not every model will be able to fight. Many will be removed as casualties before they have their chance. Models that are killed in the front rank before they are allowed to attack are replaced by models that step forward from the rear rank. A model cannot fight during a phase in which it has stepped forward into the fighting rank, regardless of its initiative. Rolling to hit, rolling to wound, armor saves, and removing casualties. These next steps are completed using the same method as they are in the shooting phase, so use those references in the same manner during the combat phase. Stepping forward and closing in. In combat, casualties are removed from the back rank of their unit as normal, even though it is models within the fighting ranks that are being slain. Slain models are considered to have been removed from the ends of the fighting rank. This represents members of the rear rank stepping forward to fill gaps, whilst models remaining in the fighting rank close in upon the enemy. A model cannot attack during the phase in which it stepped forward into the fighting rank. However, any models that remain in the fighting rank after casualties have been removed are more likely to be in base contact with the enemy, having closed in upon them. It is a good idea not to immediately remove casualties from the battlefield during the combat phase, but to temporarily place them next to their unit. There are two reasons for this. Firstly, when it comes to working out who has won combat, you will need to know how many wounds have been inflicted this turn. This can most often be quickly determined by counting the number of models removed as casualties. Secondly, Models removed as casualties before having a chance to attack, and models that step forward during the current phase cannot attack. Therefore, the number of casualties inflicted on a unit will often reduce the number of models able to fight back. By placing casualties next to their unit, you can tell at a glance how many models have been removed from the fighting rank. It can sometimes happen that a unit suffers more casualties than it has models in its fighting rank. Should this happen, casualties are removed as normal, representing casualties caused in rank or file behind the fighting rank. With casualties removed, check to see if there are any models with a lower initiative still to fight in this combat. If there are, repeat the previous steps for those models. If there are no models left to fight in combat, move on to the next subphase. Calculating combat results. Once every model engaged in the combat has fought, you must determine which side has won that round of combat. If one side has been completely wiped out, the other side is automatically the winner, regardless of the rules that follow. The Combat Result Score To determine your Combat Result Score, consult this table and calculate how many Combat Result points your unit or units have scored. Each side's basic Combat Result is equal to the number of unsaved wounds it caused during this combat phase plus any unsaved wounds a unit caused by shooting if it chose to stand and shoot as a charge reaction this turn. Should an attack or rule cause an enemy model to be removed from play as a casualty, it counts as having lost the number of wounds equal to the number it had remaining at the time it was removed. Additionally, the following bonuses apply. Plus one for each rank, plus one for each extra rank behind the first, up to the maximum determined by its troop type plus one if your unit has a standard bearer, plus one if your unit has a battle standard bearer, plus one if your unit has charged the enemy's flank arc, plus one if your unit is in close order formation, or plus two if your unit has charged the enemy's rear arc. Overkill. If a character is fighting in a challenge and kills their opponent and causes more unsaved wounds than their opponent has wounds remaining, then for each excess wound you may claim a bonus of plus one up to a maximum of plus five. 
Challenges are a special type of combat fought between two characters and can be found in the advanced rule section of the rulebook. Who is the winner? Once both sides have calculated their combat result, you will be able to determine the winner of that round of combat, i.e. the side that scored the most. If there is a clear winner, the loser will have to make a break test during the next subphase. If both sides have the same score, the combat is a draw. In such cases, the units remain locked in place until the next player's turn when the combat will continue and they will fight another round, hoping to break the deadlock. It is possible, indeed it is highly likely, that more than two units will become engaged in a single combat. When this happens, you may only use the unit in the multiple combat with the highest bonus results, be it from rank bonus, standard, or flank or rear charges, etc. This will give you the best single result without stacking the results of every unit together. Following combat resolution, we move on to break tests. Unless the combat is a draw, each unit belonging to the losing side must make a break test. To make a break test, roll 2d6 and modify the result by adding the difference between the winner's and the loser's combat result scores. Then compare the result to the unit's highest leadership characteristic. If the result of the natural roll is higher than the unit's leadership, the unit breaks and flees. If the result of the natural roll is equal to or lower than the unit's leadership, but the modified result is higher than the unit's leadership, the unit falls back in good order. If the modified result is equal to or lower than the unit's leadership, or if the roll is a natural double one, the unit gives ground. Unlike other tests you may be required to make, a break test has three possible outcomes. These are intended to reflect the way in which opposing battle lines push forward and are pressed back before ultimately becoming overwhelmed and breaking. Follow-ups and pursuit. Once break tests have been made, but before any units belonging to the losing side give ground or make a flea roll, the winning unit must decide what they will do next. Restrain and reform, follow up or pursue. Restrain and reform. To restrain and reform, make a restraint test by rolling 2d6 against the unit's leadership characteristic. If the test is failed, the unit must either follow up or pursue. If this test is passed, the unit remains where it is and may make a free reform. Follow up. A unit can make a follow up move when an enemy unit it was engaged in combat with gives ground. A unit that makes a follow up move simply follows the enemy unit, moving back into contact with it. The two units then become engaged in combat once more and remain locked in place until the next player's turn when the combat will continue. The pursuit move. When a unit makes a pursuit move, pivot it about its center so that it is facing directly towards the enemy unit it is pursuing and make a pursuit roll of 2d6. The result of this roll is the distance in inches that the pursuing unit moves directly towards the unit it is chasing. Overrun. If a unit completely destroys its enemies before the break test subphase, it may attempt to restrain and reform, or it may overrun. A unit that overruns makes a normal pursuit move, but must move directly forwards without pivoting. Catching the curse. Once the unit being pursued has completed its move, the pursuing unit is moved. If the pursuing unit makes contact with the pursued unit, it has caught its enemy and halts. If the enemy unit is fleeing, it is hacked to pieces and immediately removed from play. The pursuing unit may then attempt to reform. If the enemy unit fell back in good order, the units become engaged in combat once more, becoming locked in place until the next player's turn when the combat will continue. During the next turn, the pursuing unit counts as having charged. Pursuit off the battlefield. Should any part of a pursuing unit move into contact with or cross beyond the edge of the battlefield, it is removed from play but is not destroyed. The unit returns to the battlefield during its controlling player's next compulsory move subphase as if it were a unit of reinforcements and must be placed as close as possible to the point at which it left the battlefield. Pursuit into a fresh enemy. Pursuing units will often make contact with an enemy unit other than the one they are pursuing. In such cases, the pursuing unit counts as charging the enemy unit it will make contact with, wheeling to maximize contact if required and wheeling to align as normal. The unit that was being pursued is not caught. And that brings us to the end of the combat phase. To summarize, we begin by choosing and fighting combat. 
The active player chooses a combat and started with the models with the highest initiative, attacks are made, wounds inflicted and casualties removed. Then surviving models with lower initiative repeat this process until all models involved in the combat have fought. Then we calculate the combat result. With the fighting done, work out which side has won the combat and by how much. Unless the combat is a stalemate, one side will have lost by one, two or more combat result points. Then the break test. Each unit on the losing side of a combat must make a break test. The outcome of this test determines whether the losing unit gives ground, falls back in good order or turns tail and flees. And then finally, follow up and pursuit. Units on the winning side of a combat can choose to follow up an enemy that gives ground, to pursue an enemy that falls back in good order or breaks, or to restrain from pursuit. The psychology of war. The battlefield is full of noise, confusion and death. Faced with allies and comrades meeting grisly ends all round whilst battling fearsome foes, you may find that your warriors succumb to panic and scatter rather than fighting on. The psychological trauma of battle can cause even the bravest of warriors to panic, and when they do, they are likely to flee. We've already covered panic tests earlier in the video, but there is further information covering the finer details on page 160 and 161 of the rulebook. And there you have it. Those are the basic rules of Warhammer the Old World, which hopefully you've been able to follow along with us here in a visually easy to understand way. Once you've got to grips with all of the basic rules, there is an advanced section in the core rulebook as well. So for complete immersion, delve into the further pages of the rulebook to get to grips with the games in its entirety. Absolutely right. And of course, with your rulebook in hand, feel free to rewatch this several times so that you can get complete and total understanding and prepare yourself for the battlefield. Until next time, I've been Lawrence, this has been Joe, and we'll see you in another How to Play very, very soon.